Welcome to The Actor's Choice, where the actors and actresses have a chance to talk about themselves and their careers. Join us now for the next hour as we explore the marvelous industry of acting by actors and actresses from today's exciting show business world. And now, direct from Hollywood, here's your host, Ron Brewington. Hi, everybody. I'm Ron Brewington, and welcome to The Actor's Choice. Pardon us. We had a small technical glitch, but we're back in style again. Roll it, Tony. A king of crime is born. A mob boss who started in the streets, ready to do anything for a payoff, no matter what it cost. Ladies and gentlemen, first of all, Happy New Year 2023 to each and every one of you. As we enter this new year, we're privileged and honored to have two outstanding guests today. Our first guest is a veteran actress who has worked in television, film, and the stage. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the fabulous, the outstanding veteran actress, Gloria Henry. Greetings, 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 greetings. Hi, boy, what, a, what an introduction. Oh, Thank we you had so a much for that. <laughs> I can't believe my camera went out on me. I can't believe that. That's never done that before. It was, uh, my, well. it was my turn. <laughs> yeah, I got you. You made my day, lady, being here today, and I want to thank you for being here. Tell us where you were first born. Where were you born? Oh, golly. They call it Polk County at that time, Polk County, Florida. Uh -huh. I went to Winter Haven or Jacksonville. Okay. So, you, okay. That's where I was born. You, yeah. That's where you, did you stay there or did you go move on someplace else? Well, my mom and daddy had a big fight on somebody's lawn and she snatched me and he snatched me <laughs> and it was back and forth and he tried to take me. No, you take her and I'll take this one. And believe me, she struggled and he had an asthma attack <laughs> and down he went and into the cab she went and off to she went on that, that cab to the bus and honey, she jumped on that train as a matter of fact and made it to Jersey, Jersey City. <laughs> Jersey <laughs> <Joy -Z? laughs> <Joy -Z> City. <laughs> As a youngster, you had an idea of being a lawyer. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, I, I did. I wanted to be a lawyer. I think when I saw uh, Emmett Till and all of that, and um, it really shocked the heck out of me when I was a little girl, yes. when I saw Emmett Till and he was killed. And every time I got on an elevator with a white person, my hands would sweat. I would be so scared of white people, believe it or not. So um, I, I wanted to do something, you know, so I thought about being an attorney. And look what so you got. I, I, when I was years. in grade school and when I was getting ready to graduate high school from grade school mm -hmm. uh, into junior high, I talked to my counselor, who was also Caucasian. Mm -hmm. And as a matter of fact, most teachers were except Miss Bracey. Uh, and um, I asked her, I said, he said, what do you want to do? And I said, I want to be an attorney. Well, during that period of time, you know, there weren't many female attorneys and especially women of my hue. He said, slapped me on my, my, my wrist and said, you can be a secretary. <laughs> and and he, he had a law degree? He said, be, be realistic. You can be a secretary. So when I graduated high school, I also took shorthand and typing and everything while I was in school. They mm -hmm. gave you a trade when I was going to school. And I was working out, I, and, I, and I left and I went to Essex College of Business for Law to be a legal secretary in those days. You had to have a degree. And um, wasn't many females in that business now. All, the law office was loaded with a lot of attorneys. So I started working for the NAACP, Roy Wilkins and Robert Banks, de facto segregation at the time it was happening. And I stepped into the middle of all that wonderful, or you might just call a horrific, um, not, not wren wrenching my gut every wow. single day because we had bomb scares all the time. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, let's fast forward up a little bit out of this part of your life. Yeah. You became an actress. How did that happen? Well, make a long story short, I don't know. People just would, would just say, hey, would you model for me while I was living in New Jersey? My mother moved to Newark, 
She thought it was New York. <laughs> yes, Haitian. <laughs> and she moved to uh, Newark with her boyfriend. Mm -hmm. And here we are in Newark, New Jersey, growing up, you know, doing everything I possibly can to stay active um, with my little amateur athletic self. Uh, and um, to make a long story short, when I was growing up, uh, a lot of people wanted me to model for them. Sadie Vinay, she said, would you model my hats? And when I would go shopping for clothes, they, they would just model me around the store. And I, you know, I would, you know, my mother would take me to Bambergers and drop me off as a little kid to get my little shoes and everything. And they dress me. But um, as I, you know, they, 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 Sadie Benet, as I was like 16 or 17 years old, wanted me to model. And, and, um, and I did. And then I graduated out of that to um, when I was working as the legal secretary, I'd be walking down the street. Somebody says, would you, um, uh, would you like to shoot some, um, you know, uh, some test shots with me? And I would. And, uh, um, and et cetera, and in the film business, um, after Martin Luther King was, unfortunately, you know, I don't make it, want to make it a long story, but so many things happened that I didn't want to be in the civil rights business anymore. It was painful, just painful, distorting, and being a female anyway in the legal profession and having challenges of working with uh, lawyers and being a female in that because everybody was male. And uh, Barbara Morris uh, was a lawyer, a woman of color. And um, when Martin Luther King got killed and John F. Kennedy before that and Robert, it was just too much. It was too much for me. I said, I want beauty in my life. And whatever the reasons are, um, you know, modeling and people ask me to do little movies that were non-union, silver, silver lady I have in my resume, it was non-union. And um, I got lullabied into wanting more money, thinking that that would help me, my standard of life, because I was not, not rich. I was a poor kid and didn't even know it because we got everything. My mother gave parties every week where they raised money for their Christmas presents and I got my Christmas presents. I know I'm going a long way around, but all of this to say survival situation, I live in a poor community. Most people were on welfare and the crime was high and I was almost killed wow. by um, one of the gangs that, that um, jumped me, two guys jumped me and the guys, I hung out with the guys and they taught me how to fight. And I didn't hang out with the girls cause they were too busy saying, ain't he cute? And it was a rough community. I, I wanted to go where the power was. So the power was the dudes. So I became a dude, not in conscience, but they used to say too bad, she's a guy. Because I was busty, man. I had a thick neck. My thighs were thick. And I can outrun them. I can outfight them. I can do, I did a lot of things. I can ride my bike for hours. I can run. I can, uh, gymnastics. I was a gymnastics in grade school throughout, throughout, throughout school. And was on the, the um, horses and was able to balance myself on the gymnastic wise. Mm -hmm. And uh, swim. Uh, yeah, I learned how to swim. I can okay. swim my buns off. So to make a long story short, I became a bunny because I saw in the newspapers um, advertising, come on over here, you can make a lot of money, $1,000 a week. What? I was making $175 a week. That was my check. What bunny was this? New York Playboy Club <laughs> on 59th Dude. Street. And I, was, I, I, I moved after I left the legal business. I basically jumped up and became an account county the vice president secretary, and he would come to the Playboy Club all the time. And I said, when I looked in the papers and I saw the advertising, I said, hmm, I think I want to do this. And he laughed. That uh, vice president that I worked for of uh, this um, pup, uh, with advertising agency, he wanted to turn me into an account executive. So I, there's so much to tell you. They, it was the first time being a woman of a young lady of Hugh working for mm -hmm. them. And that was the time that so many things were going on. Yeah. That first time black woman, first time black male, first time because the business started opening up from all the chaos that was going on in the 60s. The, the Emmett Till, like I said, the lynchings and et cetera. It was just a rough time for us kids. And guys would drive by us as we were going into school, walking. We would walk to school for 45 minutes or a jog. So yes. I was always active. And I know all this prettiness behind being an actress and everything, just a lullaby you right into the Playboy Club 
when I started working there, I was shocked. Had to put this costume on too at the same time. And um, um, my, my background and my family situation, I was trying to figure that out. But when I tell you, when I hit that floor as a cigarette bunny, that's how I started out. I was, people would walk up to me and give me a hundred dollars. That was part, that was more than, that was almost my salary for the week when I worked in the civil rights business. And I was like, what? And then what the, the day was over, I, I could pull in 300, $400 for the day. I was doing great. And I was just shocked. I was stayed in shock for a while. And as it went on, when I became a bunny on the floor to be a waitress, I was making like a thousand to two thousand dollars a week in cash wow. in the sixties. In the sixties, yeah. And then, and uh -huh. then, and then, and then, working as a secretary, working as a as a waitress, really. Uh -huh. um, one day, um, Daniel Mann, um, and I forget the casting director, but they were sitting at my table, and they said, "Would you like to be in a movie?" I said to myself. I had been propositioned so much while I was at the Playboy. I was there six and a half years. And I said, talk to the bunny mother. So they did. And I, be, I became, I worked on For Love of Ivy with Sidney Poitier and Abby yeah. Lincoln. And that's when I met Abby Lincoln, the jazz singer, who was married to Max Roach. Mm -hmm. And I worked on that film for three months. And I said, wow, I like this. I made a nice piece of dough. And um, I became SAG was my first union job. And that was my introduction. But at the same time, I did happen to be going to acting classes yes. because of a lot of reasons. Mm -hmm. um, because things were introduced to me. I had done Civil Lady in a movie be that was non-union. There was so much going on in the 60s. So gotcha. many opportunities. It was only a handful of us that would go to auditions to model. And I belonged to Grace Del Marco Agency. And at that time, only a black agency could represent us. Um, uh, Hal DeWitt, who was the, um, uh, what do you, well, they had their hair straightened at that time. Hal mm -hmm. DeWitt was a top, top model. Helen Williams, if you look her up, she was a top model during that period of time. Um, one like Naomi Camp, Naomi Sims, who was later on after that period, Beverly Valdez, Emily Yancey, um, um, Judy Pace, who Judy, Pace. Of, yeah. Judy Pace, who was one of the top actresses mm -hmm. um, in the, from the 50s to the 60s, who was signed to a major studio as theirs, because the studios handled and made stars. There's so much to tell you during that period. These children today are so wonderfully blessed and lucky. Yes, they are. They are so blessed and lucky. We had a rough time. It was only a handful of us that went out on auditions wow. because our parents said, hey, that's not a career to be an actress. Hey, a singer? Are you kidding me? My mother used to hang out with Sarah Vaughn mm -hmm. and Ruth Brown in Newark, New Jersey at the living room. <laughs> um, um, uh, the, I mean, the living room and was in a couple of uh, equipment. Um, uh, there was a couple of all these private clubs where they had jazz and it was the center of jazz. Johnny Cole came out of there. Andy Bay came out of there. Dionne Warwick came out of there. Uh, Whitney Houston came out of Newark. I mean, there's so many. Um, uh, Sarah Vaughn came out of Newark. There's so much talent that came out of Newark. It was ridiculous. Leroy, Leroy Jones, yeah, mm -hmm. called Barack. Yeah, he's in Newark. He's still in Newark. Sylvia right. Robinson, his wife, went to school with me, you know? So she went to Arts High. I went to Central. Mm -hmm. I, I should have gone to Arts High. But I went and stayed in the business world, and I went over to Central High, who gave me the trade. I was doing 190 words a minute in shorthand, Woo. you know, back in the day, and typing around 70, 80 words a minute back in the day. I know I'm all over the place. There's so That's much okay. to tell you. There's so much to tell you. And it was only a handful of us that went out on auditions. Right, right. And um, we all knew each other and we all told it. And Richard Pryor, Richard Roundtree, I used to model a lot with. Uh -huh. We broke color lines with After Six Tuxedo uh -huh. um, and a number of other ads. And he's all over my um, my composite. We used to have, to have a six-page composite. Yeah. All today, all they need is one page we did everything <laughs> yep. Yep. 
1973 was a good year for you. You had movies like we just showed at the front, Black Caesar, Live in, uh, Slaughters of a Rip, Black Ripoff, Love American Style, Hell Up in Harlem. And another one you did was called Live and Let Die. Oh, yeah. Out of the, they called, I call it the Black Renaissance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because the one prior to that was our Dorothy Dandridge, Lena Horn, and Hattie from uh, Gone with the Wind, and etc. A, a wonderful array of actors. Oh my God, somebody's at my door. I can't believe it. Would you please pardon me for one moment? I'll put the phone okay. down. <laughs> nice picture. <laughs> nice lady. <laughs> uh. What year is this now? <laughs> Tony, what year is this now? 2023. 2023. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. <laughs> 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 Believe it or not, that was my, that was my pool man coming over. Oh. Uh, he just he I knew it didn't have another appointment. Yeah. So yes, so um where are we? Well, we were talking about live and left die. We just happened to have a clip. Roll it, Tony. My name's Bob. James <laughs> Bob. Names is for tombstones, baby. Waste waste it now. now. And wherever he drops in, it can mean only one thing. This is the Bob Avenger with more excitement, more action, more danger, and more more. Much, much more. Roger, Roger has James Bond 007. Wow. Well, you failed my part. You get to my scene. So yeah, yeah. I worked on that movie for about three months. Wow. I went from New Orleans to Jamaica. No, first I went to New Orleans, then to uh -huh. Jamaica, then to London, Pinewood, Pinewood Studios, the famous Pinewood Studios. We did interiors over there. Mm. And we I've been going back and forth to the UK for a while, gotcha. you know, to perform and also to work. <laughs> okay. we got a couple of photos that you might remember. Tony can hit that first. Oh, there you go. Okay, next next photo. There you go. Yeah, back in those days, that's Roger Moore and you and you. Next one. Ah, yeah. oh, there's uh, who's that? Uh, Jane Seymour. Yeah. Roger Moore and you. Oh yes. And the next one. There's a reunion. That's a reunion right there. That's uh, all the Black Bond girls: Trina Parks left to right, Naomi Harris, Holly Berry, and Gloria Henry. <laughs> yes, yes. I think there's five of us. Also, Grace Jones, but she was not there. Grace Jones. Grace yes. Jones. The Grace Jones? The who, Grace Jones. And whose, she, father, whose brother is a bishop here in town? Bishop Noel Jones? Well, so the Grace Jones from Jamaica. Right, right from Jamaica. Right, 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 right. Yes, yes, yes. They're and twins. Was, They're twins. So, she was also signed to a Black Beauty Agency the same time I was. Oh, so I know her back in the 60s. <laughs> <laughs> This year, or last year, I should say, you did a program called Snow Black. Can you talk about that for a minute? Oh, yeah. Snow Black was produced and written by and directed by my cousin, Robert Parham, P-A-R-H-A-M, yes. who is a five, a six-time world champion uh, martial artist. And uh, he he did, he wrote that movie as well as directed and produced it. It was really, it was, was, was really, I would love to, I love doing it. And I love martial arts. And one of my main things is that I think that every school mm -hmm. for physical education should have martial arts in it. Let's yes. have this playing field, this fighting, this threatening, this, this, uh, this, uh, all the people thinking that the girls are weak, think, thinking that the kids are weak. Everybody studies martial arts and put the field out there. So when you begin to attack somebody, you know, they know their stuff. Yes. Yes. That's what I would like to have in every school starting in kindergarten. Got you. Another film you did this year was Stomp Kid. 
Yes. And Stomp Kid was done by J.J. Stomp, also um, a guru, a martial artist, an excellent, so yes, excellent guru and martial artist. And he put this film out. Uh, yes. And I had a wonderful time doing that too. And again, I'm promoting to see that everybody has martial arts under their belt from, from childhood to the time you leave here, because even an old man can whip ass. Ooh, and take names. <laughs> That's right. That's right. That's right. You got a, you wrote a book. We got time to yeah. talk about that. Yes. Talk about your book, please. Yeah. And the reason why I wrote my book is uh -huh. because if anybody else wanted to tell my story, let me tell my story before I leave this earth. And um, to also to let them know what I did and how I got there as much as I possibly could. Because every road is different. Nobody is nobody's accomplishments are the identical. Nobody, nobody. You are unique. Your whole life is unique. And no matter if okay, you got to be an attorney, you got to be a doctor, you got to be a scientist, an engineer. Your road to whatever you want to do and your continued role alive yes. is different from anybody else. Wow. So when anybody says to you, how did you get there? Well, I can share with you. <laughs> and that's exactly what I wanted to do. I wanted to share. Wow. Gloria, we ran out of time. Thank you so much for being here today, especially of our first episode of the year 2023. Please, I beg you, please come back again. We can make it for that time that we didn't do this morning. Please come back again. We'll get started. God bless you, my dear. God, God bless, bless you too. Thank you. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. And uh, uh, Gloria Hendry, all I got to say is one thing. See you later, alligator. <laughs> after, oh, after supper, don't finish it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, my dear. God bless you. Thank you. Right. Vice versa. Thank you. This is Access Choice. I'm your host, Ron Brewington. We'd like to let you know we're asking our uh, uh, squad to help us get former baseball player Kurt Flood into the Baseball Hall of Fame. Now, Kurt passed away January 20th, 1997, was a husband of one of our wonderful guests, renowned actress Judy Pace. Now, all you got to do is give us a call at our office, 213-349-3941. That's 213-349-3941. We sincerely thank each and every one of you for being a part of this magnificent award for a great baseball player. Okay, roll it, Tony. For more information about the TAC Ropo channel, please call us at 213-349-3941. It's 213-349-3941. That's thank you, thank you, thank you. Roller Tony. Ladies and gentlemen, several weeks ago, I had the pleasure of being a guest on the TV program of the gentleman who is our next guest today. He's cool. He's a good guy. Let me tell you for a few things about this gentleman. He's a former celebrity model who appeared on multiple, not just a few, multiple magazines. He shows a platform where he tells his story and gives advice willing to listen and learn. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, please welcome Sherrod Sharp. Sherrod, thank you so much for being with us today. Happy New Year to you. How did 2023 arrive for you? It was good. It was good. Thanks, Ron, for having me. How was yours? Huh? How was your 2023 arrival? You didn't do any party or nothing like that? No party? No. No, just a quiet evening. Just a quiet evening. Yeah. All right. Tell us all, where were you born in? So I was actually born in, in Chicago, Illinois, uh, many years ago. 
Um, <clears throat> spent my years um, being a diehard Bulls, Bears, Cubs fan, um, and really enjoying the food of Chicago and, you know, really the music. It's a wonderful city. Got you. You're in the business. From the beginning, what made you get into this business? Well, you know, the thing, Ron, is that I was inspired by my mom uh, many years ago. Um, it was a television show called Vibe back then in 1997. And she told me, um, my brother and I it would be great to be models, you know, because they had Tyson Beckford on the show at that time. And, you know, I jumped on it. I jumped on it um, and thought, heck, that'd be a great thing to do. And next day I was in uh, Aria Model Management, you know, right at Kitty Corner from Harpool Studios where Oprah Winfrey was taping the show. Um, and it kind of kicked off from there. Wow. Now we got a picture of you as a doing some modeling work. Look at you. <laughs> Suave and Debona. <laughs> yeah, back in the day, huh? Back in the yeah. day. Back in the day. But you stayed in modeling for how long? So I stayed in modeling for many years, um, all the way to like 2015. And, you know, I was very fortunate to be able to do do rags, commercials, GQ magazine, um, you know, a lot, a lot of different things. Um, the luster products, you know, wave caps, things like that. A lot of those things are still in the stores. People always tell me they saw my wave caps in the stores. Ooh. Wow. Here's another photo that we have about, about you. you. Remember that one? Yeah, that's Joe Magazine. That's a really good magazine. They had me on the cover. They were featuring me um, talking about my show and mm -hmm. things like that. Very, very cool magazine. Very upscale. Still in still in business. That was, that was about 2016. Wow. Wow. Now, you were traveling around the world, I'm told, and running your own modeling agency in Chicago's downtown area. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wow. Tell us about that, please. Yeah, that was uh, um, WY International Models. Um, that was on Franklin Street. And back in 98, you know, I was partners at the time with a gentleman, um, Mr. Wong. And then, you know, he let me run everything. And I was able to learn the business and then also be able to uh, book gigs and, you know, basically run the show. So I was able to assist a lot of African-Americans to get in gigs and educate them on it. But also, you know, I was training models, um, how to walk, you know, how to present. And it led to a lot of gigs being booked for people. Wow. So being a model was really a passion for you, right? It was. It was. I was feeling I was fulfilling um, something that my mom put in me. And it was wonderful. I mean, it was wonderful being able to do things, um, spreads, um, you know, be able to meet wonderful people and model in New York and, you know, modeling out in California and, you know, all over the world, it was, it was really fun. It was kind of a pinch me moment, oftentimes. Okay. How long did you stay in that modeling business before you moved up? Um, I stayed in it, like I started in 97. I did it all the way to about 2015. And, mm -hmm. you know, I was then, but, you know, I was still modeling when I started my television show, actually. <laughs> so I was doing a lot of gigs and things like that while I was, uh, you know, doing my television show. That television show, let's talk about that for just a moment, sir. <laughs> Let me show you a picture of a lady that was one of your guests. Uh-huh. Yeah, Tina Knowles. Knowles. Yes. Mm -hmm. That show got off on a good toss. What made you get to that show? <coughs> well, you know, Ron, um, my experience in the fashion industry, you know, in, in 2010, when I first started the show in Chicago, yes, yes. it was called The Scent of Fashion. Mm -hmm. And it was about the modeling industry and my experiences in the industry and teaching people how not to get scammed and ripped off. And, you know, educating the models in Chicago on um, what's it like to be in the industry. So I would, you know, have a topic and then have model um, or people in the industry to back up the topic. You know, like back then I had, um, what did I have? Barbara Bates on the show, you know, and then I had, um, you know, Herb Kent, God rest his soul, and all these different wonderful people. So, you know, it was more about that. But then, you know, when I moved out to California, you know, well, right before I did, you know, it was the Sherrard show. So it was more about celebrity interviews and um, getting their stories and, you know, just great content. Yeah, indeed. People, take a moment if you would, sir, because people don't understand how long, what does it take to put a show on the air? I mean, there's a lot of work that goes into it. Tell us about that work, please. What, what the thing about it is, that's a great question, Ron, is that, you know, you have to do your research. You know, you have to, there's a lot of people who have shows on the air, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's good. But you have to be able to have um, great quality interviews. And as a host, people want to know, and they're honored to know you did your research and found things out about them that they forgot or may have forgotten. And then also, um, it, it makes it makes it show that you're doing your due diligence. You know, when you talk about topics that are interesting, interesting to them, 
Um, and it shows that you're very educated about your guests and, you know, it makes them want to come back basically yeah. when they know that you, you know, you're really engaging and you're listening because a great host, you know, listens. And also, you know, you want to be able to insert questions that are relevant. You know, it's not about you. It's about the guest. I remember that. Because you got a lot of people that work with you. You got producers, you got other folks that work with you on this program. Producers, editors, um, you have assistants, you have the wardrobe people when we're on location, you know, you have the uh, publicists, you know, you have everything, you know, you have to always make sure you thank your guests for being on the show. You don't, you don't just invite them on, but you thank them and kind of do like what Ron does. He does some really cool gifts, you know, like the piece of the gold and things like that. You know, really cool flowers for the ladies. You know, that makes people want to come back and just feel warm and fuzzy. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Here's another photo we got of you uh, with the group, some of your guests. There you go. Yeah, that was when the show was on Hollywood and Vine. Let's see, that's Kasha um, to my right. She's Rod Stewart's um, saxophone player. To uh -huh. the far right, that's Jim Gilstrap from the originals, and he's the voice of Good Times. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Stevie Wonders, you're the sunshine of my life as well. He's very popular, great guy. And then to my left, there is um that is a blues player um on the left you know he was a really great blues player um that performed with a lot a lot of different artists and stuff and then to to my right behind me is Morris Mills mm -hmm. um he's also a very popular artist he's doing very big things on the show and then to my far left that's my publicist Lynn all right how do you get guests for your show but when I first started in Chicago, um, it was not easy because Chicago is not a town where people have talk shows, except for Oprah and everything. So you find yourself having to, you know, back then, you know, talk to them and have an incentive or tell them all about the show and what it's about and things like that. But, you know, thank God, once I built credibility, you know, mm -hmm. uh, on getting guests, then the guests started tapping on my shoulder. You know, they said, wait a minute, you had Joe Mantegua on your show? Wow, man. Well, then... Why not, you know, have Frida Payne on the show? Why not have Judy Pace? You know, they know there's credibility there and stuff. Uh, why not have Robert De Niro? So, you know, it's just kind of, I don't want to say copycat, but it's a lot of parody. In this got you, got you. Here's another photo that we have of you. Yes, that's that interview with, uh, with I, I, I got to remember his name. But, but is it Buddy Guy? I'm pardon? Is it Buddy Guy? You know, it wasn't part Buddy Guy, but um, his name, it was a Buddy Guy event. They came in town um, mm -hmm. from Chicago, Lynn, and um, this, that's when my studio was on Hollywood and Vine, where they can uh -huh. be to guess, you know, um, it was it was really cool because um, tourists could be able to look in and watch the show while they were walking on Hollywood and Vine. Now, that was nice to have people look, see you in a box like that. That was beautiful. That yeah, that was cool. really cool. That was really cool. Do you miss that studio? I do in terms of how it was. It was kind of like being in Times Square, you yes. know, where people can watch your show and things like that. That was really cool and everything. Yes. But I like my studio as well in Redondo Beach now, too. I love that studio. <coughs> you get involved, excuse me, in a lot of different things. One of them is a foundation for lupus and kidney disease. Okay. Yeah, I, um, you know, I was diagnosed with um, a rare form of lupus that where my immune system attacks my kidneys. It's genetic. Um, my mom passed away from it in 2001. My brother in 2010, God rest both of their souls. So um, I'm fighting and I'm, you know, be, I started a foundation called Sharp Minded Cultural Center where um, not only people with lupus, but people with autoimmune illnesses, you know, who never had a chance, the opportunities that the Lord blessed me to have. I teach them how to read music, how to play the piano, how to play the guitar, how to model, act, sing. You know, they just um, come to my website or reach out and, you know, we in turn give them the opportunities that again, you know, their kind of illnesses may not afford them. That's people with, you know, like any kind of autoimmune illness, um, oh. HIV, hepatitis, um, lupus, you know, um, things like that. Gotcha. Uh, speaking of uh, Sharp Minded Cultural Center, we just happen to have a clip. Roll it, Tony. Very dear to me, um, you know, seeing what my mom went through and uh, my brother with this, you know, that's my way of giving back. You know, there's a lot of 
of musicians out there that uh you know people who just have the aspiration you know because it's, it's interesting i, I yes. you remember when we, when we were growing up ron there was uh music in school we could learn music in school you know it's part of a prerequisite but mm -hmm. now so many schools have taken out music to fund the football team and all that stuff which is nothing wrong with that but a lot of uh, the next Stevie Wonders and, you know, the next Jackson Browns and all that, you know, they got to find a different way to become that because there's no music program. So that's how I want to be able to give back to the foundation of teaching individuals. You know, my just brother, I take my, I take my hat off to you because of the work that you do on the foundation. And we thank you very, very much for taking it on board. I know I work with, a, you see this little pin that I wear right here. Everybody say, what's that little pin mean? Uh, I'm, I'm involved very much so with prostate cancer. I'm a double prostate cancer survivor, and I get together with a bunch of people on regular times. We unfortunately lost a guy by Dr. Fred Parrott a couple of years, about two years ago, uh, maybe less. Uh, but he had a, an idea, like you did, uh, to get out there and help people. A lot of people don't understand. You need help. Don't be too ashamed to be, I, I ain't taking that, not me. Take it. Amen. Take it. Amen. And, and most importantly, your health is the best thing you got. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, so if you're preaching, you're preaching, doc. You're preaching. I mean, you your you, your best doctor is you. You know how you feel. Mm -hmm. Go see that doctor. Amen. And that's I'm something gonna... that I'm very excited about. I encourage so many people. Don't just set up a foundation just because you have to. Set yes, up yes. one and really, really help people. You know, and leave a legacy. And um, that's bigger than the Sherrard Show. That's bigger than Pure Essence Television. That's 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 it for me. Got you. Going back just a little bit, there are, as you and I know, there are lots of TV, radio, and podcast shows out there. A lot of competition, isn't it? That is correct. That is correct. How do we get over that competition, sir? Well, you know, um, people don't care how much they know until they know how much you care. And I just find that that's what I like to do, you know, and just be compassionate. I, I don't know. I, I, I love how people, you know, love to give rave reviews. I'm just humble about how I interview, ask questions. Don't seem like I'm just firing off and uh, questions, not listening. You know, I'm really, um, I'm not a, I'm not going to shock jock you and say, where were you tonight of X, Y, and Z and trick people on the show to be investigated. That's not my thing. It's just to be able to, um, hear wonderful stories especially like you often mentioned judy pace that's a very lovely young lady and she's been on my show she's many times mm -hmm. and you know just to be able to have watched her on sanford and son or cotton comes cotton goes cotton comes to harlem and mm -hmm. you know you're seeing her and all that and, and you grew up watching her and then you know she's on your television show you know why would you want to interrogate her you know you appreciate what they've done and you give them flowers while they're still here yeah Judy's a very near, a very dear friend of mine for what she's doing and has done. I've known her for a number of years. Uh, just a marvelous, marvelous lady. I could go on for hours and hours talking about her. Uh, what advice would you give to persons who want to get into the TV celebrity host business? Don't do it just to be in front of the camera. Do it because you really want to do it right. You want to do it right and you want to be able to be an asset so people can look forward to seeing you on television. There's so many people that have done it wrong that it's, it's I don't care how great the guest is. Right, if right. they're not doing it right, I'm just going to change the channel. I'm just going right. to tune out. If you lose that and make sure you're using proper grammar, make sure you're articulate and make sure that, you know, you're, you're letting the guests talk and, and explain a point of how they, you know, that's what you brought them there for. If you want to uh, not, not let them talk, just have a monologue show. Right. Here, here. Excellent. Excellent. Tell us about some of the guests that you've had over the years. Um, well, a lot of them's on my wall, but um, <laughs> I've had, you know, Tommy Davidson, uh, Joe Montiga, Ronnie Marmo. I had a boxer, Austin Trout, on the show. Thank God. Uh, Melissa Manchester. There's, uh, there's um, you know, uh, Lou Gossett Jr. Um, you know, we've had... Uh, Michael Collier on the show. It was so great having Mary Wilson, Judy Pace, Frida Payne, um, the Supremes on the show. Um, you know, we've had um, uh, Victoria Rowell, uh, Jerry Butler. It was interesting. I saw a picture of Jerry Butler, Marshall Thompson, and Gene Chandler all together yesterday. And I said, wow, Lord bless me to have all three of them on the show. Yes. Marshall Thompson, the last remaining survivor of the Shy Lights. And, you know, to have a Jerry Butler, the Iceman. I interviewed I interviewed interviewed Jerry and uh, Jerry Butler and uh, Gene Chandler actually together in Chicago. It was a horrible snowstorm in 2013, but I had we're at a Mason 
event and is able to interview them both. What a group. Uh, what a group of people. By the way, you did have some guy by the name of Ron Brewington on your show that one time, sir? Yeah, that episode, I don't know, it's one of the most popular episodes on the channel right now, uh, Ron Brewington. Uh, the guy has an identical... <laughs> I have a twin. <laughs> Guy, there was a great episode. It's currently trending on the Pure Essence Television Network. The guy's a gentleman and a scholar. Thank you. Um, I was very privileged to meet him actually through Julie Bates, you know, her yes. event uh, year before last. So check it out. All right. Here we go. I'd like to ask you, sir, quote, I want the world to know that the Sherrod show, it will be bigger than the Jimmy Fallon show if the Lord says so. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I, mean, I saw that one. Yes, yes, yes. Attitude. Hey, Good God, attitude. Well, yeah, and I just want people to support it, um, come out, you know, be able to enjoy being a part of something wonderful. You know, Jimmy Fallon, no no knock at that, no no knock at Jimmy Kimmel. Those guys set the paved way for guys like us. Yes, but yes. I just want to be able to uh, do something bigger and greater and leave a wonderful legacy to the world to pass on. One quick question. Your show is on its various networks. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, it's on uh, Pure Essence Television Network. That's one. Um, you can see it on Roku that the Pure Essence Television Network. Um, also, it's you can get the app. It's on your Amazon or and I'm sorry, your Android device or your Apple device. And then also, if you can't get enough of the Sherrard Show, you can see it on Airy TV. Airy TV, which is 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Thank God. Go to Channel Eight. It's just for the Sherrard Show. You can see episodes I've even forgotten I've done. <laughs> Running on there. Um, there's some really cool episodes and interviews like. Um, one of my good friends, B.G. Rule, wrote a book about what really happened to Sam Cooke on the night of December 11, 1964. You want to see that interview. It's currently running on the channel and network. That's huge. And then also uh, the Temptations interview is currently running on Airy TV as well. Just to name a few. Wow. Um, Sherrod, got to come back. You got to come back. We ran out of time. We enjoyed your visit. We picked up a lot of knowledge today. And we most sincerely thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so me. much, Ryan. Thank you so much for having me. I'm oh, humbly and honored to be on a show with a gentleman and a scholar such as yourself. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I want to thank our sponsors, Harvey Bramman Photography as an Art, Ron Irwin's Lose Life, The Way to Lose Weight, Larry Buford's Book to the Future, Time Travel, Message in a Capsule, State Farm agent Carla Green, and veteran actor Rob Brownstein, Actor Training School, and Actor Space. Much thanks to our guests today, veteran actress, producer Gloria Hendry, and TV celebrity host and former celebrity model, Sherrod Sharp. And of course, special thanks to our ever-growing audience. Be well. See you next time.